Philippians 4, beginning at the eighth verse. I'm going to read for a little bit, but we'll focus on what we need to. It says here in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, do these things and the God of peace will be with you. 10 says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you did surely care, but you lacked the opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to be abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. Can we read that 13th verse together? I can do all things through Christ with strength. Who strengthens me? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, this is the gospel according to good times. Tell them again. This is the gospel according to good times. Amen. You may take your seat. Amen. Uh, anybody that has ever watched television has at some point in time watched either when it was live on television in the late 70s through 80s or watched a marathon of one of my favorite television shows, Good Times. Amen. Come on, if you ain't never seen Good Times, I'm, I'm going to ask you to turn in your black card. Amen. Um, if you can't sit through Good Times and or Sanford and Son for more than two episodes in a row, I'm questioning your ethnicity right now. Amen. Because this is what we do. This is who we are. It is a part of the fabric of our life. Good Times a sitcom set in Chicago, Illinois, in the Caprini Green housing projects, which are no longer present. They've been torn down through the process of regentrification. What would used to be the projects is now going up as million dollars condominiums and high-rises, amen. But the TV show was set in Chicago, Illinois, in the projects and the family. You had Daddy James, you had Florida, you had uh, uh, JJ, and you had Thelma. Somebody say praise the Lord for Thelma, amen, amen. Anybody, come on, can I just have a sidebar for a second? Anybody, amen, that was a young man like I was born in 1972. Anytime you saw Thelma, you just got happy. Happy. Amen. Thelma's still fine. I don't know what she eat. I don't know what she drink. I don't know who she pray to. But whatever she's doing, she need to put it in a bottle. And then you had Michael, and then you had Walona, and then Penny came along, and then as Walona would refer to Mr. Bookman, old Booger Bear himself. Amen. But these were the characters on the show that embodied the theme of the show entitled Good Times. And whether you know it or not, depending on how much of a fan you are of the show, you don't realize that the opening credits and the closing credits contains two different versions of the theme song. So, Brother Deacon, why don't you go ahead and play, beginning with the closing. We'll go from the closing to the intro. And if you, if you, if, if you got your black card today, you can sing along. Amen. Because I know you know the words. Come on, Brother Deacon. Come on, go ahead. Mm, you know that's your part. Just, just looking out of the wind, watching the asphalt grow. Thinking, it all looks hand me down. Keeping, making a wave when you can. You got, but easy credit, rip offs. Ain't we lucky? Ain't we lucky we got em. Good times. Good right. Then there's the opening credits. Good times. Good times. 
Anytime you meet a friend. Anytime you're out from under. Not getting hassled. Not getting hustled. Keeping your head. Making a way. Temporary layoffs. Easy credit ripoff. Scratching and surviving. Ain't we lucky? Good times. The deacons up here singing the song, y'all. Amen. Good times. Anytime you meet a payment. Somebody say good times. Anytime you meet a friend. Anytime you're out from under, not getting hassled, not getting hustled, keeping your head above water, making a wave when you can, temporary layoffs, but easy credit ripoffs, but scratching and surviving. Now, here's the most disputed line of the song ever. When they sing the song, it says, hanging in a chow line, meaning that you may be a homeless person or that you may be someone who is of need and you're in a line waiting to be served at a soup kitchen. But the original lyrics did not say that. The original lyrics don't say hanging in a chow line. It says, hanging in and jiving. I don't know if the white songwriters thought that was cool. I don't know what they meant by that. But hanging in and jiving, good times. Ain't we lucky we got them? Good times. But then when you go to the verse, it says, just looking out of the window, watching the asphalt grow, thinking how it all looks hand me down. And then it goes back to the refrain, keeping your head above water, making a wave. If you can. Now, when you listen to the words of the song and you actually watch the television show, there wasn't a whole lot of good times going on on this TV show. Amen. I don't know how many folk here want to live in the projects. I don't know how many people here would want to walk down the street and have to worry about gangs following you and attacking you and telling you if you don't join the gang, then they're going to kill you and your family. I don't know how many people would want to have to walk across and step across a drunk man by the name of Ned DeWino every day just to get into your apartment. I don't know how many of us would want to have to scratch and pull together money each and every week of, and day of our lives just to make it. But somehow, some way, the Evans family seem to, at the end of every episode, find themselves smiling, find themselves hugging one another, find themselves laughing and having good times. The Apostle Paul paints a picture of this very same concept when he, in this letter to the church at Philippi, could have been many places. He could have been in jail. It could have been right after he had just gotten beaten. It could have been just after a shipwreck. It could have been after he'd been bitten by a serpent. It could have been after he had been boiled in oil. It could have been while he was sitting there getting ready to lose his life. But when he began to address the church at Philippi he goes down here in the 11th verse it says not that I speak of having need but I have learned somebody say I've learned whatever state I am I've learned how to be content Oh, now that's a testimony that somebody in the building has today. You may not always have what you think you ought to have, but you know that you serve a mighty good God. And Paul says, I've learned no matter what state I'm in that I can be content. Now, content doesn't mean that I'm doing backflips. Content doesn't mean that I'm always running around quoting scriptures. Content doesn't mean that I'm going to shout in the aisles. But content means that I know that if things get worse that I serve a mighty good God. If things get better, I serve a mighty good God. If my circumstance doesn't change at all, I still serve a mighty good God. Somebody say good times. Good times is a perspective that we must establish in our own minds because one of the challenges that we have as a people is that we tell stories to ourselves. 
Come on now. How many folk here afraid of spiders? Yeah, you don't like spiders. Or oh, what's them little things, them, them little centipede things with all the little legs? You know you done cleaned up your house. You know you done pine sawed and sprayed and done everything. But you look up in the corner and one of them things with all them legs is sitting up in that corner looking down at you. And you swear to God, he's standing right at you in your face. And if you turn your back, he's going to jump down on your neck and bite you and do something terrible to you. That thing may be that little, but when you look at it, what does it look like? It looks like a big old giant creature getting ready to do something to you. And many times in our lives, we see ourselves the exact same way and tell ourselves stories. It may not be as bad as we think it is, but when we tell ourselves the story, we begin to make it greater than it really needs to be. And God forbid somebody walk up to you while you're going through, while you're feeling bad, while you're hurting, and ask you how you're doing. You've just been waiting for an opportunity to unload on somebody and tell them the truth because I know I got some folk in here that'll say I'm blessed and I'm highly favored but then I got some folk in here that I know not to ask how you doing because if I ask you how you doing it's going to be a 30 minute conversation by the time you tell me about your ingrown toenails your gray hair that you tried to dye that won't stay gray turn red when you went to the, 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 the hairdresser you tell me about your kids who you raised all your life and they don't like you no more they don't appreciate nothing you got in the car and you have had a flat tire, you went to work and somebody who'd been there three years less than you got promoted over you, you went to church and now you're not the head of your ministry, you got voted out and you don't feel accepted and I know I should not never ask you how you was doing. But we have the unique ability of telling ourselves stories. So since we can tell ourselves a negative story, don't you know we also have the ability to tell ourselves a positive story? Because your situation usually isn't as bad as you think it is. Because I've been there. Come on, I've had my pity parties. I told y'all even about my pity party menu. You got to have cold diet Pepsi. You got to have barbecue potato chips. You got to have sweets of some kind. It may be Oreo cookies, the lemon kind. Somebody said, praise God for lemon Oreos. And then you may have some of them Hershey nuggets. You know the little one, not the whole candy bar, just the nuggets. And not just the plain one, but the ones that got the toffee and the almonds in it that will bless your spirit. If you got all of them and some Twizzlers, you can have you a pity party because you can tell yourself all the stories you want to tell and your food will help you to say that your story is bad. But I dare you right at the end of that pity party if you don't push aside that Pepsi, push aside those cookies, push aside that chocolate, push aside all of that stuff and put your hands together and get on your knees and say, God, I know I might be sick, but there's somebody who's dead. God, I know I might not make as much money as I'd like to make, but somebody don't have a job. God, I know I don't have the house that I'd like to live in, but somebody is homeless in whatever state I find myself in. Somebody say, good times. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't get upset sometimes. That doesn't mean that we won't be disappointed in life sometimes. But what that means is that you got to change the way you think about your situation. Because if you leave it up to your good girlfriend and leave it up to your homeboys, the one that you call when you got problems, the one who will in reinforce all of your troubles, you know the ones, the ride or die ones. You know, you getting ready to go off and whoop somebody who didn't posted something on your Facebook page and you call Susie and Susie say, come on girl, let's go. Susie don't tell you to pray. Susie don't tell you to leave that stuff alone. Susie don't tell you to be above. Susie say, come on, let's go. Who we finna whoop? I don't care who she is. We'll talk about it later. When we leave our circumstances in the hands of people whose lives are short-sighted, don't you know they'll cut your life shorter than theirs? They don't have anything positive going on in their lives, so why are they going to encourage you to have anything positive in your life? If you want to experience good times, you need to surround yourself with some good folks. You got to be careful who you hang around with. 
you got to be careful who's feeding into your stories. You got to be careful who's corroborating the stinking thinking that you're having going on in your mind because somebody in here has that one friend who when you get down, that friend that said, girl, I understand that you're down, but don't you know that you serve a mighty good God? Don't you know that the God that you serve is faithful? I remember when you went through and a few years ago, didn't you come out on the other side? They will begin to remind you of what God has done for you. They'll begin to remind you about that time y'all both got drunk and didn't have a designated driver and was driving in the rain and hit a slick spot and you should have been dead. You should have been gone. You should have been taken out of this place, but somehow God allowed you to be shaken just enough that your buzz got killed and you were able to recover. Oh, come on, I know I got some folk in here that know what I'm talking about. You Negroes ain't been that saved all your life, that you ain't never been drunk and you ain't never done nothing and you ain't never been nowhere. You ain't never wore a mini skirt. You ain't never went out with the wrong person. You ain't never had a one night stand. You ain't never smoked no reefer. You ain't never had a cool cigarette. You ain't never smoked Benson and Hedges menthol without a filter. You ain't never done nothing because you ain't nothing but saved. And everything in your life has been nothing but hallelujah and good times. But I know some folk in here can remember the time when you were in your grave, when you were stuck in the muck and the mire, when you couldn't get yourself together, you tried to work it out on your own. Mama was praying for you. Daddy was praying for you. Big mama, my dear, papa was praying for you. But you chose to do exactly what you wanted to do and everything you touched turned to mess but then there was a God who said if you put your trust in me if you would just praise me if you would just acknowledge that I'm the God of your life you will learn like the apostle Paul how in every state you find yourself in, you can be content. Verse 12 says, I have learned how to be abased. That means that, 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 means that, that, that I've learned how to be low because some of us have had some low times in our lives. There's some folk in here right now that are in remission from cancer and remission from different things. And you can remember when you went to the doctor that day, you just went for a cough. And they told you that you had a cancerous tumor growing on the inside. And that may have been one of the lowest times in your life. You didn't know what you were going to do. You knew you couldn't fix it. Every television commercial you'd seen and everybody you knew had died immediately after finding out they had cancer. And old folk will tell you, don't know. Never let them cut on you because if they cut on you, the next thing that's going to happen to you is that you're going to go. But I'm going to tell you something about a diagnosis. A diagnosis doesn't mean death. A diagnosis is what God can use to inform the skilled persons to let them know what they need to do to get rid of that thing that's going wrong on the inside of you. So instead of a diagnosis being a down day, a diagnosis is a good time. Because I know i got some folk in here that when you found out that you had the tumor and the doctor says, I know exactly where it is, I know exactly how to treat it, I know how many chemotherapy treatments you're going to have to go through, I know how many radiation treatments you're going to have to go through, and when you get done, we got a bell that you can ring to tell everybody that you've done all that you can do, and now it's up to the man upstairs to do what he can do. Somebody say good times. It's not how it is. It's how you think it is. But then don't get so twisted to think that just because you know God that you can pray some stuff away. That ain't how stuff work. God has the unique ability of putting people on this earth who have the skills to do the surgery. Putting people on the earth to lay you on the couch and do some psychotherapy to help you talk through your situations. You can pray all you want. You can lay hands on the cancer and I'm not saying that God won't do it, but guess what? You ask God to heal you. You didn't tell him how to heal you. He can heal you through a doctor. He can heal you through some medication. He can heal you through prayer he can heal you miraculously but don't miss God in the good times focusing on the wrong stuff somebody say good times the Evans family in Chicago Illinois James Evans a, a laborer Florida Evans a domestic worker 
and their three children, JJ, a talented artist, and, and Thelma, a talented dancer, and Michael, a, a budding politician who, who had the ability not only to think and to be, have oratorical skills, and then you had Walona, the neighbor, a man who, 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 I'm not quite sure what Walona did, but Walona was always around. And, and then you had Lil Penny, amen? Miss Jackson, if you're nasty, Lil Janet Jackson, came on to the show, and Penny was a little girl who lived in the building with her mother, and she just popped up all of a sudden, and she had a crush on JJ. Y'all remember that? She had, I don't know anybody on earth that had a crush on JJ, but for whatever reason, Penny had a crush on JJ. But as they began to get to know Penny, they realized that Penny had bruises on her body that she shouldn't have had on her body. Penny was scary. Uh, when you touched her, she would jump a little bit uh, because she was in pain. And as the show developed and the episodes continued in that, that stretch of episodes, they found out that Penny's mother was abusing her. A show called Good Times, and you have a single mother abusing their child. A show called Good Times, and you had a, a, a single abusive mother taking a hot iron and putting it on her child's back. A good show called Good Times, and you have a woman beating a child to the point where she is even afraid to have human contact because she has been conditioned to know that when someone comes in contact with her, that is going to cause her pain. Can I pause for a second? Some of us in here experience the same things that Penny has gone through. You've been hurting your life. You've been damaged in your life. Somebody has theoretically and or physically taken the iron of life and placed it against your skin and you have been burned. You have been hurt. You have been gone through. You have cried nights by yourself and you have not been able to see the good in any of that situation. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it was good for you to be abused. It was God's will for you to get burned with an iron. It was God's will for you to get whooped upside your head it was God's will because that is not God's will. God's will for his people is that we be blessed and that we have experience uh, an abundance of life but there are some things that happen in life that we are not in control of. Somebody say good times. How can it be a show about good times when you have neighbors who can't afford to buy groceries but they go buy dog food and have to eat the dog food in order to sustain themselves? How can it be a show about good times when you got pimps and hustlers walking all around manipulating the people in the projects telling them how they have to live, what they need to do and if you don't do it, we're going to take care of you? How can it be good times when you have a man go to work each and every day trying to support his family and still not have enough to pay the bills. The apostle Paul says, I've learned how to be abased and I've learned how to be uh, bound. But whatever state I find myself in, he says, I'm what? I am con." tent everywhere in all things. I've learned how to be full and I've learned how to be hungry. He said, I've learned how to suffer need and I've learned how to have a whole lot of things. And then he seals it with a kiss. He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let me break your theological posture for a moment and let you know that you are not a superhero. This scripture does not give you the unadulterated power to do whatever you want to do in life simply because you have Jesus Christ in you. Can I prove it to you? I dare you to climb up on the top of this church and scream. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me and jump off 
and see what happened to you. Does your Father in heaven have the ability to send down angels to catch you before you fall? Yes, he does. But the Bible also says that God gave you a mind, body, and spirit. You can employ your body to get on the top of this building and employ your spirit to shout out a verse. But if you don't use your mind to tell your fool self that you ain't supposed to be jumping off this building, you're going to find yourself dead. When Paul says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, that means you got to back up to figure out what he said that he can do. He said, I can do a base. I can do a bound. I can do hungry. I can do full. I can do poor. I can do rich. I can do sick. I can do well. I can do sad. I can do happy. I can do mad. I can do rejoicing. And I can do all of those things through Christ because he strengthens me. I don't have the strength to do it on my own. I don't have the strength to make it on my own. I don't have the strength to convince myself that my situation is better than it is. Oh, but when you go back to the beginning, he said, be careful for nothing but everything in prayer and supplication with this giving with your heart be made, let your heart's request be made known unto God. He said, finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, think on these things. You got to change your mind in order to tap into God's strength. Because if you try to do it on your own, you can't understand it. There's some folk in here that know that you've been blessed and you can't explain to nobody how you've been blessed. You'd have had some things work out in your life and you couldn't explain it for yourself because won't nobody understand it. You don't know where the money came from. You don't know how the situation got fixed, but you knew that you was broke and the next thing you knew that God had done something in your life. You knew that you were sad and somebody told a joke and next thing you knew you was laughing. You knew that you were going through and hey, somebody reached in and pulled and you found yourself coming out of through. I have learned in whatever state I find myself, I'm content. But there was one episode when James had gone off to work in another city to make some money for his family. Any man knows what that's about. You do what you got to do to take care of your family. And I'm gonna say this, and I don't wanna mess up nobody's household, but I'm gonna call it like I see it. If you a man sitting at home and not trying to find a job, and your wife or your woman or your baby's mama or your situation is out working two and three jobs while you sit at home playing Xbox and PlayStation, old folks say you ain't of no account because a man will do what a man has to do to take care of his family. I'm not saying that you're going to get every job you apply for. I'm not saying that you ain't out looking, but there's some folk who ain't even making an attempt and relying on this woman to do what she is doing for the household. James Evans wasn't that type of guy. James was going to do whatever James needed to do to make sure that his family was taken care of. Somebody say good times. And Florida came home one day after being doing all the work that she did as a domestic and she got a telegram from her husband and she was excited to get the telegram. Some of y'all know when your husbands, your wives, your folk go out of town and you get that text message from them, you, you get that call from them, you feel real good be, because you know they're thinking about you. And she got the telegram and when she opened the telegram, the telegram said, Miss Evans, we're sorry to inform you that your husband James was in a car accident. And in the car accident, he did not survive. The man that left your house alive is dead. The man who takes care of your family is gone. The man who will do anything to provide for his children has been in a car accident in another state and you can't even see him while he is lying there on the coroner's table. You left all by yourself, Florida. You don't know what to do, Florida. And the story goes that she told everybody and everybody's upset, but as she was going along, she kept herself busy. You know how we do. 
In order to keep your mind off of your situation, we will create other situations to keep our minds off our situations. We will keep ourselves busy majoring in minor things because we want to ignore the problem in front of us. We will major in minor things because we don't want to deal with the elephant in the room. We will major in minor things while that sickness, that poison, that hate, that trauma is killing us, but we're pretending like everything is all right. Can I tell y'all something? The God we serve is a big boy and if you got some things you need to complain to him about he has a big ear and he will listen to your complaints how do I know Job told God what he was going through David told God what he was going through even Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane said father if it be your will take this thing from me I can't take it I don't know how I'm going to do it I can't make it God I don't want to do I I don't want to die, God. Take this thing from me. But then he used a compound word called nevertheless. If it be your will, I'll do it. I'll go through it. I'll endure it. I'll make my way. After a while, the pressure of James's death got to Florida and no longer could she pretend that things weren't wrong. No longer could she walk around with her head held up high. No longer could she tell everybody, oh, it's gonna be all right because some of us have gotten to a place where we realize, no, it ain't all right. No, this don't feel good. And Florida was in the kitchen and she was preparing, cleaning up and she picked up the punch bowl, seemingly a insignificant matter and all of a sudden the reality of her situation came across her mind and she dropped the punch bowl. Now if you could just freeze time and imagine in your own life those times when you've dropped the punch bowl, those times where reality met up with what's going on in your mind, those times when your circumstances manifest themselves in some little thing, and when she dropped the punch bowl, everything shattered, and she cried out, damn, damn, damn. And somebody looking at me, oh, Lord, he didn't cuss in church. But let me tell you something. When you got a situation that ain't working your way, sometimes you have to damn that thing. You have to send that thing where it needs to go. You have to tell it where it needs and where it has place in your life. You can't celebrate the broken punch bowl. Sometimes you get to a point where you have it your own damn, damn, damn moments. And some of us can admit that you've had those times where things are working so bad that all you can do is scream and all you can do is holler and somebody thinks that the words are profane. But sometimes only effective words get things done effectively and she could have said oh my goodness she could have said oh my 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 but she said what she needed to say to get that thing out of her heart so that she can move beyond the broken glass and move to where God is going to put it back together again because good time doesn't mean that your punch bowl is going to always be together good time doesn't mean that you won't experience death in your life good time doesn't mean that you won't go through some stuff good times mean that even when I drop the punch bowl and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs that my God in heaven is able to hear my humble cry and open up his ears, open up his arms, open up his eyes and come see about my broken
broken pieces and God is gathering the broken pieces of my life and putting it back together again. The prophet said he went down to the potter's house and saw the potter with a piece of clay on the wheel and all of a sudden the piece of clay got all messed up but the potter said that's all right because in my hands I know how to mold the clay. In my hands I know how to put the punch bowl back together. In my hands I know how to heal a broken spirit. In my hands I know how to turn a frown into a smile and the potter began to massage that thing and some of y'all know that if you've ever had a deep tissue massage that it don't always feel good when it starts out because the masseuse will find the points in your body that are the most tense, the points in your body that are the most uh, inflamed and they will begin to work those places and you go through a little pain but you're being massaged. You go through a little trouble but you're being massaged and God is in the process of massaging your life to a point where you can look at the pain of that broken bowl and shout out good times. I can remember how me and James used to spend time together hugged up in front of the kids, giving them a positive example of what a husband and wife used to look like. Good times. I can remember those times where he would go to work and we didn't have enough money, but we would get together and we'd sit together and we would pray and ask God to take this little bit and turn it into much. And God would do it the same way he did with those two fish and the five barley loaves. How many know that the two fish and the five loaves Loaves ain't the blessing. The blessing is that they had 12 baskets left over after God put his hands on it. Somebody say good times. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your circumstance is, but I've been sick for about six months. I've been going to the doctor every time I turned around with a different symptom and every time I went, the doctor said you ain't got nothing. Every test he took, he said ain't nothing wrong with you. And I could have been upset and I'm going to tell you I was upset. There were some days, Gabby will tell you, that I wouldn't even get out of the bed. There were some days that I would just stay upstairs all by myself. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't know that if I was a hypochondriac, if I was confusing myself, if the devil was trying to get me. I had all of these things made up in my mind. Some of y'all asked me, well, have looked at me funny over the last month since October with the last time I cut my hair and wanted to know how come he ain't cut his hair. What kind of preacher would let his hair grow in the dreadlocks? What, what kind of man of God would get up there with his hair twisted? twisted like that. The reason that I let my hair grow is that I, even, I thought I was dying. I thought that with everything that was going on in my body that I didn't think I was going to make it. But I read in the Bible that there was a man named Samson and Samson was a Nazarite. And if Samson grew his hair that God would empower him not through his hair but through his faithfulness of being content in what his situation is and understanding that God would do it for him. Now that might sound crazy to some of y'all because it sounds crazy to me to say it to myself that I stopped cutting my hair on my birthday, October 17th, 2014, with the hopes that God would enable me with Samson's strength to find out what was wrong with me and get my thing fixed. Now to somebody that may sound stupid. To me it don't even sound all that sane. But I take medication for my sanity so I can deal with my own crazy. Some of y'all need to deal with your crazy in your own way. But when I decided Lord I can't do it by myself. Lord I can't take it by myself. I don't know what's wrong. The doctors don't know what's wrong. But one day my wife was on the internet and she decided to do a search on all of my symptoms and she came back and said baby I don't know what this is but I think you got it and I'm sitting there like you crazy as a Betsy bug you ain't nobody's I know you got a doctor I know you got a PhD but you are not a medical doctor she said no I want you to listen to me and men let me put a, a, a comma right here for you your wives are smarter than you can I tell you that sometimes you got to listen to the woman in your life because she'll tell you some stuff that sound crazy and you know it's crazy, but she didn't already thought through the crazy. She didn't already made it from crazy to accomplished and you still stuck on the fact that this crazy woman is telling you something crazy to do. I went to the doctor and I said, doctor, I think I got this. He said, how do you think that? I said, my wife was on the internet. I could see the look on his face. As soon as I said it, my wife was on the internet. I said, no, look here, I pay good insurance. I want you to find out if this is what I got. He said, okay, we can test you to rule it out. 
The first test he did came back with the numbers that pointed to what Gabby was on the internet searching for. The second test he did, the numbers came back pointing to exactly what Gabby said she found on the internet. And the doctor got perplexed because he had been through six to eight years of medical school. He had been through all of this stuff and all of this training and he knew what good times and bad times were supposed to look like. And he probably thought I was crazy because he was the first one to prescribe me antidepressants in the first place. And now I'm in his office with these made up illnesses, but he don't know the God that my wife knows. He don't know the God that I know. So the fourth test brought back numbers that confirmed exactly what Gabby, the non-medical doctor, looked up on the internet and found. And then he said, wait a minute. We got to send you to some folk who know a little bit more than I know. And so he sent me to a specialist. Somebody say specialist. Some of us are going to our friends and they're like our general physician. They can tell you only so many things. They can only tell you what they know based on their experience. They have their interpretation of good times and their interpretation of bad times. But when God steps in your life, he'll take you from a friend to a specialist. And I know a man named Jesus who specializes in, in things that I can't understand. He specializes in fixing stuff that have been broken. He specializes in fixing the punch bowls that have been broken in my life. And when he sent me to the specialist, he didn't send me to just any specialist. He said the specialist I'm sending you to is the top specialist in the United States of America. 99.9% .9 of their cases that they're treating the persons are 100% healed. Can I tell y'all something? That God does not have a .01 failure rate. 99 and a half won't do with my God. 99.9 .9 won't do with my God. If you go to the specialist, he's able to do 100% of your miracle. 100% of your blessing. 100% of your breakthrough. And you might be having a bad time but when the specialist puts his hands on you you'll shout out good times anytime you meet a payment good times anytime you meet a friend good times anytime you're out from under and you're not getting hassled you're not getting hustled keeping your head above water grabbing that wave if you can, temporary layoff, what they say. Come on, y'all ain't saved enough for me today. Temporary layoffs, easy credit ripoffs, scratching and surviving, hanging in a child line. I like that one better. Good time. Somebody touch your name and say, ain't we lucky we got them? Come on, turn to somebody else and say, ain't we lucky we got them? But now we're not talking about T-H-E-M. Change it around and say H-I-M. Ain't we lucky we got him? Touch somebody and tell them. Because without him, them will always be bad times. But I'm like Paul. I've been up and I've been down. I've been rich and I've been poor. I've been sick and I've been well. But whatever state I find myself in, I have learned, somebody said learned, how to be content. I can do, scratch that, I can endure, no, take that out, I can make it through anything because I have Christ in me. He is my strength. He is my comfort. He is my way out of no way. He's my company. Keep late in the midnight hour when there's nobody for me to call. He's my healer, my deliverer, my righteousness, my banner. He is my all and all. Tell somebody I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now come on, give God a hand praise in the place today. The gospel. 
according to good times. 